But here's what I'm going to challenge you to do today, and a truth that I think we all need to live into, and it's this. We need to put our faith before our politics. We need to put our faith before our politics. And some, you know what some of you are thinking? Some of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, I put mine, but what about, yeah, yeah, how about that? We need to put our faith before our politics. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? In other words, to put your faith filter up front before your political filter. To put your faith filter on top of your political filter. To put your political filter somewhere down the line after that. To be a Christ follower first and a Democrat second. To be a Christ follower first and a Republican second. To be a Christ follower first and a libertarian or independent or whatever flavor you are second. Now whatever our political views, would you consider subjugating those political views to the good news of Jesus Christ and the filter of faith and your Christian values. Because let's face it, if for no other reason than this, when you die, you don't go to Washington, D.C. Did you know that? Did you know that when you die, you do not go to Washington, D.C.? Uh, but let me tell you, and here's what I know. Something could happen in your life that would make your political persuasion completely irrelevant. I have never visited someone in the hospital who is sick or dying that had their eyes closed and their hands folded on their chest or clutching mine tightly that said, could you please read me some of the Constitution? <laughs> never. Never. I've never had someone holding my hand at their bedside say to me, you know, I really wish I would have voted differently in that election. People don't do that. People, there are things that are more important than politics. And I'm going to say today that your faith and your relationships are much more important than your politics. And what I'm going to challenge you to do, and believe me, I don't think the average person can pull this off, but just to put your faith ahead of your politics. Now, I'm going to say this because I don't want anybody to get up and walk out. I really don't. What I'm going to say is this. You should have an opinion. You should have an opinion. And you should be willing to go to bat for your opinion. Melanie says that I have an opinion about everything. And you know what I defend myself with? Everyone has an opinion about everything. And Melanie says, actually... Everyone doesn't have an opinion about everything, and people are okay with that. And we just, uh, you know, one of my least favorite phrases, we agree to disagree about that. I'm not suggesting that if you're a Christian that you're going to vote for a particular candidate or that all Christians should lean into one party. All I'm saying and all I'm challenging you to do is to put your faith and your convictions ahead of your politics. Now, for many of you, you're sitting here saying, I'm so glad you're talking about this, Ruffin. I know I'm right, but I also know the person sitting next to me is wrong. I am very willing to say that I'm right and they're wrong. Very few of us see a conflict between our faith and our politics, right? Very few of us see a conflict between our faith and our politics. In fact, you would argue um, that, you know, I'm a Republican because I'm a Christian. I'm a Democrat because I'm a Christian. I'm a Libertarian or God knows what else because I'm a Christian. You would argue that with me. But here's the, uh, here's the thing. The point is that when it comes to putting your faith before your politics, when it comes to putting your faith before your politics, it's not enough to say, Something simple like this. I'm going to put the Bible first and my politics second. Why is that not enough? Because you can find something in the Bible to back up what you say. I mean, you've, most of you have read the Bible in 90 days. You can find something in the Bible to back up your political views, can't you? Those of you that aren't nodding your heads, I hope you're nodding your hearts right now because we've all done it. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Here's something else that really doesn't work either. Don't be offended by this. 
Put Jesus first and then put your political party second. Have you read the Gospels? You can comb through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and find something that Jesus said or Jesus did to back up whatever you're talking about or wherever you stand. But when we read the Gospels, Jesus didn't come to be on anybody's side, right? Anybody see that? Jesus came to take over. Jesus came to save all of humanity. Jesus didn't come to take his side. And everybody is so concerned about co-opting Jesus to support their perspective or their point of view. And that's not what Jesus, Jesus, I'm just going to say this, Jesus resists that type, that type of use. But simply trying to find something that Jesus said to support what you believe politically isn't enough. And simply putting Jesus before politics isn't enough for us to get this right. We actually have to do what Jesus did. We actually have to do what Jesus did. And here's what Jesus did. Jesus put people first and politics second. Jesus put people first and politics second. Or another way to say it, and please, if you're confused by any of the stuff on the slides, it's out of my brain. So you have a right to be confused about, you, you know me, I love you, I hope you love me. By the end of the sermon, you might not. Okay. We can disagree on what's best for people. You know what I'm saying? We can disagree on how to deliver what's best for people. What we dare not disagree on that Jesus modeled for us day in and day out in his ministry, what we dare not disagree on is that what's best for people is what's best. Do you get it? We can disagree on what's best for people, but we dare not disagree that what's best for people is what's best. Friends, that's what Jesus modeled for us in his ministry. That we can disagree about what's best for people. Namely, any bill, anything before Congress. Name any of the things that we're debating as a nation. And we can debate about which side or which version is best for people. But we can never debate whether or not what's best for people is what is best. We can't do it. And when we read the Gospels, it's very clear. There's a theme through the Gospels. Jesus was for what's best for people. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. Jesus didn't come to die for a building or for an I, or, or, a, a terra firma or earth or whatever. Jesus came and gave his life for people. People are what matter. Jesus loves people and puts people first. The thing that drove Jesus crazy was religious people that used religious laws to hurt actual people. And Jesus would say over and over again, you had it backwards. God didn't create people for the law. God created the law for people. God didn't create people for religion. God created religion for people. And if you grew up in a church, you're so familiar with this next passage of scripture that you can probably quote part of the verse. The people come to Jesus, the really smart folks, the Pharisees and people who just wanted to trap him. And they're like, Jesus, we've got a question for you, pal. We've got a question for you. We want to know what you think God wants from us. How would you interpret it? What God wants from us? We want to hear it from you, Jesus. We want to hear it from you. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he didn't even let them catch a breath or get a word in when he says this. And the second 
is like it. It's just as important as that first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. How radical is this? That you think about it. We've got this passage of scripture here, this verse. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Friends, what is that? That is all internal stuff. This is easy, right? You can align your heart and your soul and your mind under God. There's a part B. There's a second part. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the act of reaching out and loving your neighbor, your faith is made complete. This is hard because if you're just talking about what you believe, you can say anything to yourself, right? You can make anything work. But tell me I've got to love my neighbor. Then the rubber hits the road because I'm going to treat my neighbor, my tendency is to treat my neighbor what? The way that he treats me. How about that? We're really good friends as long as he doesn't come on my property line. Seriously. Seriously. The way he treats my kids, I want to treat his, I don't know, his rabbits or whatever. Anyway, but, but, but here's the deal. Loving your neighbors yourself is so important. And here's how important it is. Jesus says this, and it's just, these guys are just, their minds are blown. Jesus says all of the law and the prophets, you know, there are over 600 laws in the Old Testament. And you've got all the, the prophetic stuff in the Old Testament. All the laws and the prophets hang on those two commands. So if you forget everything Jesus is saying, if you leave your Torah at home, you just need to remember these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, Jesus says there's none of this tit for tat thing. Jesus says, let me tell you what's most important to me. What's most important to me is that you love God on the inside and you show it on the outside. You show it on the outside. And how do we do it? By caring for the people that God's placed in our influence if you want to keep your faith in front of your politics, and as Christ followers, we should all want to put our faith in front of our politics. This is the place to begin. To use Jesus' words, we can disagree. We can disagree on what's best for our neighbors, but we dare not forget that what's best for our neighbors is really what's best. Capiche? Capiche? All right, good. One of the phrases that I hear over and over again, especially in political seasons when people are arguing or getting after each other or whatever, we can agree to disagree. And I got to tell you, I've come to really loathe that phrase. Let me tell you why. Because too often people use it as a shutoff valve. What you're saying is, when you get to the point in a conversation when we agree to disagree is I'm done listening to you. I am done. And as Christ followers, there is a more important conversation that we're after that you should never, and I mean ever, compromise your influence with people about. And it's an eternal conversation. What do we talked about the last good Lord, five weeks. You are not a body with a soul. You are a, you are a soul with a body. Friends, our time on this earth is a blip on the timeline of eternity. It's just a blip. And when you've got that big perspective you can be in the moment with people that you disagree with. And I want to talk just a, for a few minutes about that. Just switching gears just a little bit. I know what you're thinking, right? I think I know what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah, Ruffin's probably right, but he's really taking the fun out of the day for me right now. He has. Um, you know, I was going to take a nap during church, but Ruffin's really, he's kind of stepped on my toes in such a way that I might not be able to do that comfortably now. But don't worry, there's this afternoon. 
You can do it this afternoon. So here's, here's what I'd like to throw at you now. I just want you to think about it and how this looks in your life. Here's what I want you to think about. Your behavior makes sense to who? You. Everybody's behavior makes sense to them, right? I mean, people can usually come up with a good reason for doing what they do. Um, on Sunday afternoons, I was, before this football season, I, I would just go home from church, and you know what I would do? I have a corner of the couch that actually has my body indentation in it. And I just, I sit down, and I just kind of sink in there, and I watch football till I fall asleep in three minutes. And then it's like, I mean, it's just, it's what I do. I can explain it. It's for the good of the people. It's for the good of the, anyway. So uh, it's, Melanie would dispute that, by the way. Um, but, but we can explain what we do. We can explain our behavior, right? How about this one? Your political views make sense to you. Your political views make sense to you. So here's, here's how I want to couch this. Um, when you think about this, why did you vote for him or her? Why would you support that? Why would you march against that? Why would you be up in arms about that? Why would you send everybody that article? And in the days of social media, I mean, honestly, when you post something on Facebook or you send something to everybody's email address in your account, what you're doing is you're putting something in front of hundreds, even thousands of people. What are you saying when you send that stuff out? Your political views makes perfect sense to you. Everybody's political views make perfect sense to him or her. And here's the lesson, and I think it's very important for us as Christ followers to buy into this and to think about it. And here it is. When you don't now know how someone could do such a thing, when you don't know how somebody could support such a view or a bill when you don't know how in the world they could do or think or support such a thing or believe such a thing, it's probably because there's something that you don't know. It's probably because there's something that you don't know about that person or know about them. So one of the best things you could do to help keep your faith in front of your politics is when you find yourself in one of those contentious conversations around a dinner table. Thanksgiving's coming up, people. I mean, I don't know how, how many of you are going to find yourself around a table with differing views from people, and it's going to come up. But there are some people who just quit minding their business very quickly and start talking into every conversation around them. You guys know who I'm talking about, right? We've each got people in our lives that that. There are some people who are taking this thing so seriously. They're like, you know, I might have to move because of that turd next door. Oh, I'm sorry, because of that person next door and our views are so different. I just might to have to move there. And here's what I would encourage you to do. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. This is a big deal. Be a student, not a critic. Be a student, not a critic. Well, there are a lot of teachers in here this morning. Be a student and not a critic. What am I talking about? Because if you're a student, not a critic, you're going to learn something. And if you don't think you need to learn anything, you are arrogant and you're insecure. If you don't think there's anything for you to learn, you are arrogant and you are insecure. Period. The other coin, side of the coin is that you might think, you know, you, you might be God if you think you're, you know, you know everything and, and, and whatever. And people would like to see you come with me on hospital visitations because, you know, just for the, the healing factor there. But here's the scoop. It might be a you problem, not a political problem when you get in those situations. This is a season to learn. And the way we learn is by deciding and telling ourselves, I will be a student and not a critic. For some of us, that's easy. For others of us, we need to put, be a student, not a critic, on our mirrors, on our toothbrushes, on our car dashboards. I mean, basically every flat surface that there is that you can put a post-it note that says, be a student, not a critic, period. Period. You know, here's another thing. And this is, like I said, this is my stuff. 
This isn't for everybody. And if it doesn't make any sense to you, you know me. So, okay, so let's see. Um, Here's what I'm talking about. Here are some questions that I've used um, to disarm conversations with people that I disagree with when I find myself in conversations with them, especially around political issues. Um, And here's what I believe. Let me tell you where I'm coming from. I believe that there is no relationship worth being compromised over politics because faith is more important than politics. And when you die, you don't go to Washington, D.C. All right. Jesus followers, I believe, should be the most confident, the most curious, the most composed, and the most compassionate people in every room that they're in. Followers of Christ should be the most confident. Why should you be confident? Because you know whose you are. You belong to God in sickness and in health all day long before the beginning of the universe until time memoria. You belong to God. You can be confident. You are not a body with a soul. You are a soul with a body and you are God's. Christians should be the most curious people. There's nothing to be afraid of. We shouldn't be afraid of science. Some people just get so hostile when we, when we talk about science. You know what I, what I think and the way I look at it? Here's how I look at it. New discoveries all the time. That's how God did it. That's how God did it. And it's okay to see that. We should be the most composed. Why should we be the most composed? Because every one of us has walked through the fire at some point in our lives. You've been through that terrible thing and you've come out of it and the Lord has brought you out of it. You should be composed. And you should be compassionate. Why? Because at some point... God reached out to us with the arms and the love of Jesus Christ and pulled us out of that pit that we were in. Christians, Jesus followers, should be the most confident, the most curious, the most composed, and the most compassionate people wherever they are, especially when you're talking about divisive issues. Put your faith before your politics. All right. So there's this other thing. It came up with four questions that I was talking about. Here's, here they are. Four questions to gain or keep, keep influence with people that you're having a difficult conversation with or that you really, can I just say, you just might not want to. Anyway, so number one question to disarm a conversation that's really charged up. What led you to that view? What led you to that view? Instead of, hey, can we just agree to disagree? How about making a step as a follower of Christ and loving your neighbor as yourself and actually being interested in where they're coming from and why they believe what they believe? What led you to that view? Um, You know, the way you talk sometimes, the way you communicate says a lot more than the words you say. Can we agree on that? Uh, and so, so you might say, somebody, you may say this, you know, what led you to that view and what they say? You, okay, I understand that. that. That's interesting. Or you can smile and, and disarm somebody and say, <laughs> that's the most crazy thing I've ever heard, like ever. Um, but, but, you know, it's important to be engaged. The second question that I've used is, is have you always held this view. If your views change, why did it change? And this is concern for people's spirit and concerns for their soul, not just concern about what's going on today in our political environment. Um, Here's another one. Have you actually met him or her? You know, we do a lot of judging of people on what we hear. Which leads me to my last question. I get most of my information from the media. Where do you get yours from? Because I believe this with all my heart. We are all operating from a very limited pool of information. Most of which is sensationalized. To the point where it is, we should have a filter that tells us that we should think about these things through. We totally should. We should. All right. 
Some of you are thinking this, man, this is the worst sermon I've ever heard. This just stinks. So can I go ahead and wrap it up? Yeah, that's all right. Let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. The grand finale. Is it okay to have an opinion? Absolutely. Is it okay to argue your opinion and defend your opinion? Yes, you betcha. Is it okay, Christ follower, to make a point at the expense of your eternal influence with someone else? Absolutely, positively, no. It is not. All of us have experienced relationships that were broken that didn't break for a day. They didn't break for a month. They broke for years. And I'm telling you right now, a political difference is not worth breaking your influence in someone's life. Period. Not for days, months, or years. Should you jeopardize a relationship? No. No. Because we're not fighting for today. We are fighting for eternity with people. Period. Let's come back around to something that we said earlier. We can disagree on what's best for people. But we dare not disagree that what's best for people is what's best. We can disagree about the method. We dare not disagree that people are the most important thing in this equation. Friends, aren't you glad next week is Bountiful Harvest? You're not going to have to hear this anymore. It's going to be thank the Lord and thank each other. You'll have an opportunity to thank God for, for everything, for the food. God bless it. I'd like for you to let me to pray for all of us right now. And here's my prayer. Are you supposed to tell people what you're going to pray before you pray it? My prayer is that you'd be able to turn that boiling pot off that might be very close to your heart right now and turn your effort to eternal conversations and an eternal view of the importance of relationships with people. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for preserving This amazing text. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second command is just as important as the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you for preserving those words and that thought. Thank you for allowing us to live in a country where we can even talk about this. Lord, there are so many nations in which you can't experience this type of open dialogue and conversations. So thank you, Father, for allowing us to have the opportunity to do this today. Gracious God, thank you for the stewardship that we've been blessed with of our great republic. Lord, help us to get this thing right. And help us especially to get it right as a community of Christians. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Please stand for our closing hymn.